Hello and welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Leads podcast with me, Mark Bagnall, Managing Director of Theo James Recruitment. Today, I was over the moon to invite Jessica Williams, the MD of Just Williams, onto the show. Jessica is someone I've known quite some time through the Entrepreneurs Forum, really keen to pick her brains on everything sales and marketing within manufacturing. And this episode definitely did not disappoint. You're going to leave today with, with loads of tips and takeaways. Something that you might be considering is potentially outsourcing your sales and marketing. Something you might be considering is looking to train your staff because I think for a number of years now, sales and marketing in manufacturing has been neglected. And actually a lot of companies are now realizing that it is the key to your success. Do you have a plan in place, a documented plan and vision for your sales and marketing? Is it something that you have someone in-house to take the lead or are you looking to outsource? Jessica goes in detail about all the tips and takeaways and talks in depth and unbelievable passion about her journey, their journey from sustainability and vehicle status, um, which is which has transformed their business and ties in perfectly to how we can help our retention, recruitment and sales strategy in a business. You're going to learn a lot from this episode and a lot from Jessica. So please feel free to uh, grab a coffee, sit back and listen or watch. Please, 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 if you wouldn't mind just hitting that like and subscribe button, it means the world to me and helps grow the show. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy. Morning, right. Fantastic. We have uh, Jessica Williams on the podcast this morning. And uh, Jessica, someone who I know very well from uh, the Entrepreneurs Forum. We've been trying to set a date for this quite some time, but both very busy. So uh, really looking forward to having Jessica on this morning. Um, Jessica, if you wouldn't mind uh, quickly introducing yourself, that would be uh, superb, please. That's all right. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. So absolutely. Uh, my name is Jessica Williams. I'm the founder um, and CEO of Just Williams, which is a sales and marketing business based down in Teesside. Uh, we've also got a training business, uh, which is the Sales Academy, which is, I think, three years old now. And both businesses are B Corps certified. And we work very much in a similar space as you guys in the built environment, manufacturing, engineering space. Excellent. Really looking to dig, dig into that and get some good tips for people listening. First question is the same question I ask everyone, particularly for you leading the business you've led for so long. What does it mean to you to be a leader? That's, that, that's the bold question to start with. I love it. Yeah. Um, do you know what? I think this has changed for me over the years, as I think, you know, a lot of businesses or business owners will probably relate to. For me as a leader, it, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to take my business in, in quite a bold direction at the moment. We're, we're really growing. We're, we're diversifying. And for me as a leader, it's very much setting that course. It's bringing the right people around me to be able to deliver the ambition of the business. And that are um, the people that want to get on the bus, so to speak, the people that believe in the vision. B Corps, as I say, is, is who we are. and It's a huge part of, of who we are and, and what we believe in and therefore having the people. So setting the tone of the business, um, making sure that the culture's right, making sure that we're working with the right clients, making sure that we've got the right people um, and ensuring that actually my team have got everything that they need to be as successful as we can be and to, um, you know, to achieve the milestones that, that we're looking to to. to to achieve and I think from from a characteristic perspective as a leader I think you know you, you certainly need to have quite a lot of grit and resilience um but also that um unwavering passion and determination that you can succeed as an organization right and, and you've got bags of passion and uh, I know you've got great great reputation in what you do why because if you look at sales and marketing you know I guess you could have chosen any industry to, to work in and because it's well, completely transferable in terms of of what you do and industry why manufacturing why those sort of sectors because i guess difficult sectors i just don't lend themselves naturally to that type of, of mindset was that part of the challenge or what, what, what was that led you to it um honestly it was by kind of default really initially because we we started really with a few clients in that sector a, a lot of years ago now probably seven years ago and and i think it was very clear that the, that was an industry that um could use our help um, and that we worked really well with and as we you know found our way I suppose in the industry in regards to connections and, and really understanding it, it it naturally grew and I think for for us from a sales and marketing perspective the the industry is 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 material um, it's about having the right processes it's about having the right procedures 
from a sales and marketing perspective in place. So the sector doesn't matter too much. And I think because the way that we work on a pro we're very process heavy from a sales and marketing perspective, and that really aligns itself well with our engineering manufacturing clients. Yeah, yeah, I like that. It's um, because there is a product to sell. Do you find when you start working with um, let's take a, a stereotypical manufacturing firm who perhaps relatively new to that, is there things that you see quite often almost low hanging fruit and things that that, that not necessarily the mistakes that they make, but obvious things that you can sort of change instantly, would you say that people maybe miss? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think very few organisations actually have a sales or and or a sales and marketing strategy. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's I think sometimes the word strategy is a little bit overused. Um, but actually having, you know, if you've got a business ambition, if you've got uh, business objectives, you have to align your sales and marketing strategy to that. That's fundamental. And um, it's it can't just be luck. So, you know, I've worked in sales for an awful long time and, and, I, and I think a lot of sales can be you know has been for a lot of people look where it's just about getting out there and you you know you win clients but you can't repeat that and therefore if you can't repeat it you can't scale it so you know you can't repeat it because there's no process behind it so you know I, I i think that industry lends itself really really well because it's for me it's about really understanding the model really understand the process that sits behind it and and you know um playing and repeat and, and learning from that all the time um and i and i think you know the fact that a lot of industries, you know, come to us, a lot of organisations come to us and say, right, we want to grow. We absolutely want to grow the business. And that's great because that's absolutely what we do. But the first thing that I always bring businesses back to is you've got to look at your existing back book. So what's your plan on existing account management, on retention, on something that we call customer lifetime value? I always say I can probably, you know, the, the likelihood is we'll be able to increase your existing customer growth by 10% before we even look at new business. So you've got to start there before you look at new business. And I think that's where we add a lot of value to existing to, to, to businesses that come to us. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that's probably where most people, probably my mindset goes to, isn't it? We need we need to do better, we need to grow, we need to look for new shiny things. We're actually often it's the it's the things right in front of you, I guess. Is is that upselling, I guess in the manufacturing business then is that upselling with with current clients is that is that looking for for different business within that then that you tend to sort of look for initially absolutely i mean i think again very few businesses have got an existing customer journey mapped out yeah. so when you when you look at your existing customers the reason that they're with you might what the reason that they came to you might not be the reason that they're still with you now and you know your business more than likely has changed their business is more than likely than change but actually we, we we don't necessarily have those conversations so you know really mapping out what does what what's your average how long how long does your average customer stay with you what's their average spend all of those aspects are really really important and looking at how you can add value and I think you know we rarely have that kind of deep conversation with our customers and say so what else can we do you know what are the products and services where's the business going and really be able to be you know a, a longer term kind of create that longer term partnership so you know that customer lifetime value is so important to yeah some people use the term upsell you know solutions provider what it is and I mean we're all we're all operating in a highly saturated market yeah. So if you don't do these things, if you don't add value, if you don't do all of these additional things, then somebody else will in your place. So it's just so important that we can't we can't get complacent with our existing clients in essence. We can't just kind of think about growing a business based purely on new business growth. We've got to look at that existing bank book before we turn to that. Yeah, I, I'm massive, I'm massively resonate with this because I, I I've so made that mistake, but definitely been that journey because oh, we've all been there. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's all about growth. I think you get so excited about a new client. I think this is fantastic. And and I think it's probably, you know, we're about to be in year 10 soon. I think it's probably about year six, year, six, year seven. I was so pleased that would I looked and thought, wow, well, we've placed with all these manufacturers. But actually, when I looked at looked at my accounts, they change every single year. You know, there was no obvious top 15, no obvious top 20. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to sell the business. But if we were looking to sell the business, it will be difficult because they'll go, you've got no, like you say, that, that lifetime. Attraction. Yeah, yeah, massively. And that's the same for manufacturers, isn't it? Someone to value a business or to look at how stable it is, they will look at that whole lifetime. Yeah. You've got to look at that longevity. And I think, you know, one thing that I always say is that, you know, we've, we've, you've probably got, let's just say everyone should have like a top five or a top 10 customer base. Now you, you can do two versions of this. You can do your top 
top 10 as it is now and you could do your top 10 based on opportunity so a lot of people do top 10 based on spend but don't necessarily assess margin um but you can also do your top 10 based on opportunity the ones that maybe that you've got well the ones that you've got the potential to grow in and they're the, the relationships to really nurture and you know i think when you look at a high value customer the automatic aspect is that we think about the actual pound that they spend with us but it's not because you know a high value customer to me is somebody that yeah you know we've got the opportunity to grow that remuneration aspect but also they can refer us in they're influential you know they've got the ability to introduce us to multiple other things that other businesses they've got the ability to be a brand ambassador for us there's opportunities from a case studies perspective all of those things you know, so when you look at opportunity, you've got to look at kind of a multifaceted approach rather than just the pound. Yeah. Well, I'd like to take your advice, please, on when's the right time to decide or what, where's it going to be to be to decide whether to, to outsource sales and marketing or to, to bring it internally? Because I think what I see a lot of, and, I, and this is outside looking in, is companies that go, we need to do some more sales and marketing. Let's, for example, try and do it as cheap as possible. Let's let's even hire an apprentice and they can look after Facebook groups. And it's mm-hmm. it's it's awareness stuff. There's no actual return investment piece on it, but it's quite difficult in marketing to mm-hmm. go, that's where it came from. But then they see, see companies that go, right, we now need to outsource. Or actually, we now need to bring it in. Where's that sort of tipping point, would you say, or, or signs that companies should look for to go, we need to maximise sales and and... So I'm just going to totally sit on the fence here, right? So yeah. um, every business is different, which yeah. they are. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, you're absolutely right. Outsourcing isn't for everybody. And you do have to have a mindset, a, a certain mindset as an organisation to outsource. Um, you know, if you are an absolute micro kind of manager in terms of that, yeah, outsourcing is never going to be for you in any guise. Um, for us, the, uh, the way the businesses that we work with and where we found our sweet spot is the ones that are probably kind of maybe about three years into trading, They've seen that kind of uh, that 20% growth year on year. So they're on that, you know, scale up journey. Um, and they're, you know, they're they're looking for that ambition into new markets. Um, they've probably got anywhere above kind of six or seven staff, but the owner founder is is often the one that's still leading the charge in regards to sales. Now you pay for what you get, right? So, you know, I always find it really uh, it's like, Granted, I'm very biased in regards to this, so kind of, you know, cards on the table in regards to that. But, you know, people talk about cash is king. It absolutely is. But your cash comes from sales. So, you know, you you can't put somebody that, you know, that isn't experienced or that maybe doesn't have the qualifications or whatever it might be in front of your client base and expect massive things. If you can't grow the business, you can't expect somebody else to do it in the matter of a few weeks. So, you know, from a sales and marketing perspective, you know, we say that we'll come in, um, you know, tends to be, as I say, if they've been training for a number of years, so we don't deal with startups, we don't tend to deal with corporates. It's that mid SME space where they're really looking for that growth. They maybe haven't got that infrastructure, but they've got a reputation that we can kind of, re- we really then leverage on and maximise that. So every business is different, uh, as I say, but I think it just depends on your ambition from a growth perspective, um, your risk appetite. And you know what sectors you're working in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 does make perfect sense because again, you see a lot of companies that probably don't appreciate the importance of it of that sales piece. I I think I've seen that flip the last sort of year. I think we've seen more companies outsource and more companies mm. their sell just sell division in general and understand that the sales needs to come before before anything. And mm. I, I would I would I think we've seen that mentality flip. Have you seen that? Have you seen trends? Yeah, say? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, again, I get, I always get asked that question, which was first sales and marketing. Uh, and so, so just William started as a sales business, right. and then about four years in, we 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 brought marketing into the fold. So obviously, I was like, well, sales, you know, of course it is, it's sales. But I have to say, it's marketing because you know you've got to have that brand visibility. It's far more difficult from a sales perspective to to, to convert if nobody's heard who you are or, or knows a lot about you, your brand or values or all of those different things. So marketing has to come, has to come first. People have to, you know, there has to be that brand awareness and that brand visibility in the market before your salespeople come in. But I think we have seen a difference in that. I mean, I, I'm a massive believer in, in, in outsourcing, you know, I, I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I know what our, our my business's capabilities are and not. And, you know, I think it could, we were talking before about, you know, I'm renovating my house. 
um, you know, it would take me hours to do the stuff that somebody can do in a, in a, in a minute, in, in, in 10 minutes. You know, you, you've got to know your strengths. And I think organisations as a cost saving metric often think about, oh, we'll just bring somebody in or an apprentice or something like that. And, you know, bring in somebody that looks after sales and marketing, which, you know, are such different <laughs> um, specialisms. You know, you can't have one person that looks after sales and marketing. It's ridiculous. Um, it's like saying one person can look after HR and finance and people and all of those different things. Is they're, they're very different kind of aspects. But I think businesses are changing in the way that they work towards that. Yeah, uh, they probably. I think people know what good looks like now because, like you say, when they when they brought an apprentice or something, they probably didn't realise that they were effective or, or ineffective. But actually, you bring an outsourced company, you can actually because I think you, because you you invest in that, you expect, and then they see. They see obviously the success from it and, it and it works and it's the same anything. But um, I think a lot of people find it hard to manage and turn that sales because they don't understand it. So I think in that instance, much better off outsourcing it. Because like you say, if you want something in your house, you're going to pay a special to do it. If you can't do it yourself, there's no difference, is yeah. there? No, absolutely. I think you, you've got to have those processes in place. You know, it's sales is not about luck. You know, one, I think once a business gets past that initial friends and family and contact stage, you know, the, the, the true metric of success for me is then, well, once you're past that, how are you still growing or, you know, in, in what way are you still growing and what markets are you operating in? And, you know, if you don't have a process that you've got behind that or understanding and, you know, it's it's sales has changed so much since the pandemic you know so much and salespeople's jobs have got an, an awful lot more complicated because ha we have to be much more multifaceted now we have to you know if you think how many different platforms you engage on if you think how much information you consume you think how many competitors we've all now got in the market we have to be different we have to be stand out you know we have to be so much more yeah on it all the time um and operate in in on, on on multiple platforms so you know i think sales people you know you'll you'll see um i, I I'm, I'm not a fan of a lazy salesperson right and I, I set up the business nine years ago now just over nine years we're probably in probably uh, i think it's our 10th birthday next so um set it up really to as with this kind of goal to, to professionalize the sales industry because there is no entry criteria yeah you don't very few people go into sales as a choice <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's often a default career and one that you know if you look at again I, you know I, I'm, I'm like a broken record with this but if you look at our european and our u.s counterparts it's viewed very very differently in the uk it's not it's actually only in the last three years that the office of national statistics has class sales as a profession and put it in in the actual kind of statistics that come out it's not it's not on its on its own it's it's grouped in with marketing but that just says it all but if you look at businesses you know once you get past that friends and family once you do all of that who represents a business who is that face of the business that's getting you out there? Who's getting you in front of those 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 you know future clients? It's a really really important important role, and and I think you know it, it is changing. I don't think the industry is changing quickly enough, and I don't think there's enough enough investment in in our salespeople. I think you know what CPD do most salespeople do? Not enough, yeah. in my opinion. I agree. I agree. It's bizarre thing because in in the US. Everyone tells me how well respected that sales mm -hmm. person is. It's almost like it's it's well, why are you a salesperson. But in the UK, it's got still got that stigma to it that we don't like being mm -hmm. sold. And it's that it's almost like an arrogance to it. it it's weird. It's uh, middle of recruitment is probably a level above that in terms of even worse for the, for the stigma attached to it. But just sales in general, I I, I, I feel that will change because I think you are getting more real senior roles now within within sales, and I think people mm -hmm. will start to respect that profession. On the more did, but I completely agree. There needs to be more trained behind it because it's such a complex job now. It's 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 so difficult. So that you mentioned there about the the platform piece was really interesting because you're completely right. There's a new platform every day, and 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 I'm I'm like a mag probably stuff. You know, somebody comes about. Well, we've got to get on this. We've got to get on that. Do you know what I mean? And and, and yeah. what's your advice for companies that do you need to spread yourself on everything or do you need to go, this is my niche and this is where my customer base is. So I need to get really good at this. What, what, what's your thoughts? I think, you know, exactly what I'm going to say here <laughs> is, is you, you know, I think a lot of businesses do, you know, it's, 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 we all get, we all look at that kind of shiny new thing, don't we? But, you know, it, it, it 
the the key thing that you've got to do from a sales and marketing perspective is any organization is really understand your market so we do and um, we call them icp w- workshops which are ideal client profiles or you know um, your ideal client persona or avatars or whatever you call them you've really got to get remarkably clear on exactly who your target audience is you know if one more person says to me everyone you know you're like how, do you, how can you market to everyone how can you sell to everyone so, you know, you've got to be very, very specific around who your target audience is and, and really map that out. So, for example, I might say, well, actually, I want to work with um, Northeast manufacturing businesses that, you know, have been going between five and 25 years that, you know, are in a 50 mile, 50 mile radius of the offices. That they've got X amount of turnover, X amount of employees, but they're looking for growth. So straight away, I'm narrowing that pool remarkably. Um, and then everything, once you understand what the ICP looks like, everything sits around that. So you you really need to delve into who are those people, what are those businesses and what they're doing. Once you know that, you can look at which membership organisations should I join, which social platforms should should I be on, which e- events and awards and exhibitions should I attend. You know, it all comes back to, you know, what publications should I be, you know, placing articles in and reading you know it all comes back to who is your ideal client profile to me and therefore you can map everything out around it so you know it's it's got to go back to that strategic process-based approach it can't just be luck it can't just be I'm going to attend a networking event and hope I meet somebody that's relevant or I'm going to try something on this platform and, and and see if it works and you know you've got to find out where are your customers it's pointless you being on one platform if all your customers are operating on another so you know you, you've just always got to bring it back to that and sometimes well less is definitely more you know you, you, I met a company the other day who were like who were you know were, were, I think they were members of I don't know 10 membership organizations and I was like oh is that beneficial for you uh and they were, you know a rhetorical question of course it's not because they haven't got the resource to be able to bet you know to attend those things so membership organizations are a brilliant way of really understanding what's going on in that environment what's going on in that network working with collaboratively with other businesses there being involved in their events awards their social platforms all of those things but you've got to you know it's like anything it's like a crm system you, you have to put the time and effort into it to get the reward you can't just join things and hope it's going to work so everything's got to be aligned if you know i'd really urge anybody to go back to who is your target audience and be really really specific and you don't you know, you don't, somebody said to me, oh, I've got like a thousand lines of data. You don't need, it's not about having thousands and thousands of lines of data. I mean, we work on a B2B basis, so granted it's a bit different. It's about having a very, very clear view of this is who we're trying to target and this is how we're going to do it. Apologies for interrupting this podcast for a very quick 30 second pitch of my business. Theo James are a specialist manufacturing and engineering recruitment search firm based in Seaham in the Northeast. If you're looking for any staff, or a new opportunity yourself from a semi-skilled level right the way up to C-suite executive, then please get in touch. We have a specialist consultant in each discipline ready to help. I'm extremely proud of what we've built over the years. And I'd love to extend that service out to you. Thank you. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, that's great advice. Do you think sometimes that there is a missing gap between operations and sales when actually your companies work in harmony together, whether that's the outsource model, the insource, however it is, because I think people stay in the lanes too much. But for me, the the ideas should come really from the operations piece and the sales should make that happen, essentially. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think, you know, there needs to be a lot more collaboration across you know, multiple departments within organisations because, you know, you've got a variety there of people that are customer are in front of the customer and understanding what's actually the customer wants and needs what's working well what's working what's not working you know and you've got potentially that innovative aspect of well this could be more efficient or we could try it this way from from an internal perspective so organizations you know that that work in silos just simply you know for me aren't, aren't 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 fit for the future really it's about a collaborative piece and you know i think it's really important to to bring those operational people you know into the line into the um you know into the view of the customer so they can have those conversations with them and they can see firsthand what the customer needs wants and you know and, and, and what the future of the business potentially could look like right you mentioned you're right at the start i know a big part of your your journey now is all on the, the, the sustainability piece the esg obviously b corp 
which is mm-hmm. huge now in manufacturing. And um, it's something I, I've I've talked about with a lot of the clients for, for years. And probably for the last six months, I've just seen a, a real surge towards it now. The companies are now mm. back to me, which is, which is amazing. Um, when did that become something that was always going to be really important to you, particularly getting peak up status? Because I know that's not easy. No, indeed. Um, so I, f- I think the pandemic, you know, I defy anyone that says the pandemic didn't change them personally or or their view on business. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it certainly did me. Uh, and I think, you know, 2020, we were already looking at, you know, the, we, I think that 2019, 2020, we were all inundated with things like net zero and investors in people and all these different aspects. And, you know, as a small business, it, it's very difficult to kind of manage all of those. And so, you know, we always wanted, we would, we did a lot anyway. We've always done a lot as an organization, um, which was reflective in our, in our certification score, but I, I, we didn't have a framework that sat behind it. We didn't have that infrastructure. And ultimately, you know, as the founder of the business, often it was kind of, oh, Jess just wants to do this, or I'm just trying this. You know, and, and again, that's not that's not a scalable model. So I'd heard about B Corp years and years ago. Uh, and then in 20, 2020, um, obviously the pandemic happened and we all had to make some really tough calls. And then in 2021, you know, I did a lot more research and I reached out to uh, a couple of the B Corps in the uh, in the region and realised that this was absolutely, you know, the the, the, the right path for us. It's unbelievably comprehensive and rightly so. Um, it took us uh, over probably about fourteen months um, to from 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 starting the process to sorry no it wasn't it was about eighteen months to to being certified and that was us going you know full on. Um, but it's given us it's just it's changed the business massively changed the business and continues to do so. The thing I love about B Corp is it gives that you know sustainability. It, it isn't you know a destination in terms of you get there yeah. it's a continuous aspect and what i love about b core is basically we have to you have to score five percent more you have to have that continuous improvement mm. and that's the that's the that's the mentality i want in my business one of our values is progressive because it's always about right how do we get better how do we improve how do we you know do this and you know getting b core so we we started the process in 2021 um and it was very much around making sure that we were yeah, we we were fit for purpose moving forward. Um, there is a lot of greenwashing out there. There's a lot of tick boxing. Um, B Corp is absolutely not that. There's not a chance that you could ever get B Corp. Uh, and actually, I was at um, I was at a B Corp board dinner last night. So Nikki Clark from uh, Chief Executive Amy's on on the board of 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 uh, B Lab UK. And they had they had the board meeting in, in Durham and she invited five northeast businesses that are B Corps for a dinner uh, last night at Ramside Hall, which was lovely and really, really fascinating because we were all saying the same thing. Whilst, we, whilst we've been through this process and a lot of us, we're going to have to recertify next year. A lot of businesses are now recertifying, which is every three years, is we were all saying, you know, don't make it any easier. Right. because it's it's a really challenging process. It's like 200 questions. And, and as I say, it's it. It's unbelievable. There is not a part of your business that doesn't get affected by this. Yeah. And it asks you some really difficult questions, which aren't easy at, to answer at times. But my God, it's made such a difference to my business. And I think, you know, we, for, for me, there, I mean, there are five pillars of Beacon. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm you know, labouring the point here. I'm really passionate about this. Is that a business should be used as a force for good. Now, let me just clarify that because this is not talking about we don't make profit. This is very, this is really important. I absolutely believe in making profit as a business, but I think the way that you make profit and the way that you therefore distribute it really matters. It is about purpose-led profit. And, you you know, I, I can go on about this all day, but businesses have got a duty to do more. We've got a duty to do more to our communities. If we didn't learn that from the pandemic, then I don't know when we ever will. Um, I, do you want me to give you a couple of examples of what we've done? Absolutely, thank you. Sorry, yeah. I'm to- I'm totally passionate about this. Can you tell? Yeah, no, go for it. Um, yeah. So, um, and 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 I think you know the, the whole kind of ESG thing. Um, there was a view for many years that it was the corporate's responsibility. You know, where when you look at the makeup of the northeast, and you know, ninety eight percent are small businesses, so have less than ten people. So we all have a responsibility to do this. But B Corp is 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 around the five pillars, which is the environment. He, obviously for most of us the governance structure our people our communities and our customers so kind of really obvious things right 
but it gives you that infrastructure it gives you that framework to really walk to work towards and, and it's aligned with the united nations sustainable development goals sorry i'm just using those of acronyms now Anna. um the sdgs yeah and it's about really kind of creating um a much more um sustainable business which who who, who doesn't want that so we've done like loads of things on each one of the pillars. Um, so you know, from really kind of small things to, and and we're in a, it's it's you know we're a service based business. So, but I know a couple of manufacturing businesses that have gone through this, that are going through this, and you know it's it's pretty comprehensive. But there's loads of little things that 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 we can all do that make such a, a big difference. From reviewing your local supply chain to you know who 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 are your suppliers, who do you use? We've gone from like twenty two percent to nearly seventy percent local supply chain, which has made quite a significant impact in our local economy. You know, we do loads of things for the community. We've got a charity partner. Um, we do loads of kind of recycling and try and educate, you know, a lot of people around that. We put training courses on. Um, my team get, you know, wellness days. We've got private health care. We do loads of different things. Um, and, I, you know, I've got a whole massive list of stuff that we've done over the years. And we've, we're aiming to raise £50,000 by our 10th birthday because I do lots of crazy challenges and things like that. So it's just bringing that awareness, I think, which is so important. Amazing that, and um, the passion you exude there is is brilliant, and it's what is needed for this time of stuff. Because I think that's the difference. Because if if companies are just trying to tick boxes and just trying to meet targets that have been set by their sister companies and all this sort of stuff, then they'll never get there. You know, you mentioned there that that progression because it's 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 not something you just reach and you that you've ticked that box. It's huge. What do you think has been the the biggest benefit to your business? Would you say? having this is at the forefront i mean we so all big core businesses have to do an impact report once a year at the end of the financial year so we monitor this really clearly and i think this is a, this is a challenge that we were discussing last night that i think a lot of businesses still have this perception is, is you know show me what the return on investment is show me what the impact is and it's very clear you know we've got a higher um, we've got a lower attrition rate, so we've got a high retention rate of staff, we've got a high retention rate of customers, we've got nearly a 90% retention rate of customers. Um, so for me, that speaks volumes in terms of who we are as a business, what we believe in. It does affect who we work with, so we won't work with everybody. Um, we, you know, If you don't align to the B Corp principles, we simply won't work with you, and that's quite a difficult choice for any entrepreneur. Um, you know, it, it, you, you do have to, you, you know, you do have to believe in this. This is not a tick box exercise size or ultimately it's down to your ethics and values um but for us you know we've seen you know higher retention rates in our staff and our customers you know we've seen um well we're we're, we're we're recruiting quite a lot at the moment we're on a real big growth plan at the moment we've got people that want to come and work for us you know which is just which sounds like a daft thing to say but they're like oh, i've heard about you you know your b course is amazing um you know, and, and those types of things. And, and and I think, you know, the impact that we've had is we've supported the local community so much. Um, you know, we're part of the local community now as a, as a business, more so than we ever were. And, you know, we've we've won contracts as a result of it. I know we have, you know, we've won business. Um, we, you know, we, 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 we liaise with quite a lot of the local universities. Um, so I'm, uh, I've been made a fellow of Northumbria University, which is which right. is amazing. Uh, and we're holding a responsible business, the North's first responsible business conference in January with Northumbria University. So, you know, it's 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 led us in lots of directions, which is really as exciting as a business. And we only we only certified a year ago. So, you know, a year and a bit ago. So, you know, we're right at the start of this journey. And I think it's it's fair that um, maybe if we have this conversation in a few more years time, I'll be able to tell you more. No, it's, it's amazing. I think it's amazing to talk, talk about this sort of stuff because, you know, there's so much stuff there which I still don't think people really realise those benefits to it because mm. it's that supply chain piece. Every manufacturing firm, the, the bulk of the bulk of their stability is going to be their supply chain and, and who yeah. they work with. And in, until they fix that, they'll not fix their problem. But actually, exactly that, when companies start to do something about it themselves, that chain effect, domino effect is going to be absolutely massive and then stop working with the people who just don't care about it don't change anything it's huge um it's and it, you know what it's really yeah. exciting we're um we've just joined a company called greenify so we can you know every hire we make we can it's essentially that uh, we can offset our, and their carbon footprint as various other things oh, I that. you know it's really really interesting and i'm glad you mentioned it the the the, the positive effect that has on staff as well mm -hmm. who 
actually really care. Do you know what I mean? I, I was a bit, probably three years ago, I, th I thought, is it virtual signaling? All these people saying, but actually, no, the pe people now, mindset have changed. People really care about this sort of stuff. It's not just to sort mm. of look like they do. People actually care about sustainability, which is amazing because it's the, the generation coming through now have just completely different mindset, which is, which is, which is so, which is brilliant because it's needed to. They've got a completely different mindset to previous generations, which we're in a, a world now where everyone's moaning about skill shortages and retention and recruitment. Then mm -hmm. this is an obvious thing to do to do something about it is to is to fix this problem, which fixes so many problems. And the, if it that's just... not not going to affect positively, is to is to positively affect your retention. Amazing, because it does make a difference. One hundred percent. It doesn't. Let's be really clear. ESG, uh, so environmental, societal, and governance is not going away. You know, yeah. this is not a flash in the pan. This is not just like a phase. This is not in vogue. You know, it is here to stay. You know, you you, you can't you can't yeah. read the press any day or read any organisations, company statements without seeing it. So you know, you have to do something about it. And I can't stress that enough. And you know, B Corp, there are there are other opportunities. There are other you know frameworks out. Out there i like b corp because it gives me the framework to really kind of guide me in terms of doing that but i think a lot of businesses you know really need to to to, to you know to embrace it and i think a lot are when there. there's been a huge change um mm -hmm. in the uk and certainly the northeast market as well a lot of businesses are getting on board but it's about integrating it into your everyday business and that's the key thing is if you look at it's like sales and marketing or anything if you look at it on a standalone basis it's very difficult to incorporate and embed into the business's culture. Whereas actually, if you actually, you know, look at it as a, as a comprehensive, mm -hmm. yeah, platform for everything else, it makes a difference. Have you seen a, a positive effect of clients you're working with who have incorporated sustainability into their marketing and sales funnel, would you say? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah absolutely so yeah i mean a lot of our clients now you know again we've we've we we use a local supply chain so though you know that's really positive for those guys um we've we've appointed a lot of charity partners for our clients so you know they're doing much more as a team now collaboratively so you know that team ethos is really there and it's helping the communities that they serve we're putting that structure in place for them um, and we're monitoring it which is really really key you know we, we're creating those kind of local collaborative connections so you know it's positively impacting the business financially it's positively impacting um the 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 the, the, the workforce that they have um, in terms of that engagement piece. It's positively impacting the communities that they're serving. It's positively impacting charities. So, you know, and there's the environmental piece as well. So, you know, there's there's lots of aspects there. So we do, as I say, we do loads of different things, but we we, we take our clients on tree planting and, and all those different types of things, litter picking and all those different things. And it's not just the act itself. It's the fact that, you know, you're getting people together um, you're getting them to to mix with different parts of the community you know you're going out and you're doing something good um, and the positive impact that, that can have it, it's, it's it's as far from fluffy as it gets yeah. it's really really fundamental and we need to do more like things like that to really invest in our people and invest in our customers and you know it's we were talking earlier about that customer engagement and we talk about customer lifetime values you've got to get your customers involved in this you can't force them right <laughs> and you know the first year for us was a bit tough but you know you can't force them into it but it's it's learning by osmosis right so if you're around people that are constantly kind of doing this and um you know you, we're doing this all the time is they kind of get on board and, it, and it's great to see and we've seen some of our customers that were like no not doing that to actually now they're kind of really embracing it and in some of the industries that perhaps you kind of go what um so it's yeah it's it's great to see and and this is not in, just to be really really clear this is not a bad use of time because that's what someone said to me they were like oh god you must have you know what <laughs> how on earth are you managing all of this and i'm like oh, right so let's be let's be frank so okay so i'm doing a little pick in my local community with with my my charity partner quite a few of my clients um all of my team so I'm spending time with all of those people, having chats, kind of doing the right thing, you know, once a quarter, once a month, whatever it might be. That's an amazing use of my time. That's an amazing use of the impact that we can have as a business. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I went a little picking day with uh, Bill Geothermal, one of my clients, and um, a few people kind of said, like, I don't work with, oh, that's, it. that's an easy day. Do you know I mean they don't, that's not, uh, you're not working? Well, yeah. It's yeah. Because the thing I love about what you're saying is, it all ties in perfectly to to build the brand and build the community. Because I think people think build the brand, they just think, oh, it's a logo. 
And actually, no, it, it's you're, what you're doing there is you're building a full community of people who who know your business are, what you represent, what your values are, and you're bringing people together. That's that's building the brand, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, you know, I think why would somebody want to work with you as a customer? Why would somebody want to work for you as, as, a, as a team member? You know, if somebody looked at your business now, what where are they going to go? They're going to go on social media, aren't they? They're going to go on the website. They're going to meet somebody and, you know, touch points from a marketing perspective is it used to be kind of anywhere six, seven, eight, nine touch points from meeting somebody from a prospect to convert in, convert into a customer is now over 20. So all of these different aspects are touch points. And, you know, I, I look at those businesses that I want to work with and I kind of go, oh, are they supporting the community? Are they doing all of that? And people that, you know, that, that when you're hiring, people, you know, our, our future generations are looking at that. This is not like, a, oh, it's a nice thing to do. They want that. And if you're not doing it, you know, we're not really, we're not future proofing our business to be able to do that. And, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it happens overnight. I'm not saying, you know, there isn't there isn't some challenges. And, you know, I've had to make some really tough calls. And, you know, sometimes I think there was one one time where it was like 450. Sorry, I'm getting blind about the sun here. I can't complain. But um, it was like 450% more to choose a local supplier than it would be for one of our national partners. So it's not always easy. It's not always the cheapest thing to do. But I think it's really important. I think they do. Yeah, 100%. The... Um... You're going. You mentioned there. You're going for an exciting period of growth as well, which is uh, right. Tell me a little about what what's happening for you now. Loads. Yeah. So as I said, the business is um nine and a, nine and a half years old, um, yeah. something like that. And yeah, we we've 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 gone through the the crazy roller coaster ride of lots of different things, and you know, I think it's um it's a service based business, which you know is is quite difficult to 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 grow. Let me just move slightly back out of the sunshine. Sorry. <laughs> I can't complain about it, but I'm like literally kind of getting blinded here. Um so yeah, so there's there's the I think it was probably well it was the B core journey that started it really is is kind of saying, so what's this what does the future look like? What you know, what's this all about? And I think you get to that point as a business owner where you go, What is this all about? And let's be honest, we all lose our mojo at time. We all kind of think this is bloody tough, right? <laughs> How am I going to keep going? And what? why Why am I going to keep going? Um, and I think, you know, the B Corps journey really gave us that structure, really gave us that ambition. Um, I did the Entrepreneurs Forum Scale-Up Programme early this year and I've appointed a non-exec and I'm very, very clear now. So we've got a five-year plan. Uh, we are kind of seven months, nine months into it, um, on target, obviously, um, above target, actually. Um, and very, very clear about where we're heading. And um, I'm really, really excited about that. I'm very, very um, driven. I'm very passionate. Um, I'm very dedicated to what we're trying to, to, to create. And I think that's coming across because, you know, the staff that we're hiring now and the team that I've got are just brilliant and the customers that we've got are just brilliant. And it's don't I, I'm making it sound like it's easy and you know fine well it's not. Um, but yeah, we've got a really fantastic structure now and I've got a really, you know, we've got a really clear plan about where we're going, what we're doing. And, you know, there's some exciting things on the future in, you know, in on the horizon. We're, you know, we're we we're looking to acquire another business. We're looking at investment. Um, and that's in just Williams. The sales academy is obviously a completely separate business. So, you know, we're going to be doing a rebrand for that. So we've got loads of exciting things happening. Um, and you know, it's 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 so great to be able to step back and work on the business rather than in it as cliche as that sounds and have an amazing team that I know are going to deliver that so um yeah I, I, it's it's funny isn't it because you know I'm kind of nine and a bit years in now and you know people say what you know do you regret anything that you've done or would you do things differently I think it's a really interesting question because you know you can only ever do you can only ever make the decisions based on the information and the expertise you have at the time so I've done that. Uh, would I do it differently now? Yes, I would, because, you know, I've, I've learned more and I'm more reflective. But I think, you know, we're in a really good position now for, 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 for growth. Um, and I'm genuinely really excited about the future. Amazing. And, and the Sales Academy, presumably that is for, for manufacturers to, to get involved in as well, I guess, to try and up, upsell that, yeah? Yeah, so so as I say, Just Williams is the, the original business. That's the sales and marketing outsource business. The second business is the sales academy. So again, started that really three years ago. We trained 4,000 people now, which is amazing. We hold our annual an annual conference. 
we do workshops, mentoring, um, online courses, loads of different things. And, you know, it's around customer service and sales. So it's a great entry point, really, if you're looking to upskill people within your organization um, to, 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 to get to that level to professionalize the sales industry. So we're really looking at growing that as well at the moment, which is, yeah, which is exciting, terrifying, but exciting. <laughs> and if you are, uh, let's say, Someone listening is an ops manager, owner of a manufacturing business, someone senior who is a decision maker. And they're all and in about that. Do we need, you know, do we need to invest on that sales piece? What would you say is the is the the biggest sign that they potentially do, would you say? That you sort the of, biggest what? Sorry, say that again. The biggest sign that they probably do need to invest either in an outsourcing and, and speaking to, to you ideally or looking to try and upsell some of their current staff? Because I think I still think it's quite a neglected area. So what would you say is the biggest sign that people should be now starting to, to sort of work on this, would you say? I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Sales and marketing per se is, are, you know, are massively, you know, neglected aspects of most businesses. Is If you haven't got a strategy, if you don't know where your growth is going to come from, then you need to start looking at options. You know, if you're looking at your, um, you know, it's the definition of madness doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? So, you know, I think if you haven't got those processes in place, you know, there's there's a toolkit that, you know, everybody needs regardless of your size from a sales perspective. You know, if you haven't got that CRM system, if you don't understand your client profiles, if you don't know the platforms, if you haven't got processes, if you haven't got procedures, if you haven't got any of those aspects and they're being consistently actioned and hit then it's something to to really look at and from a brand visibility perspective you know it, it's about it's about people knowing who you are what you do and how you can help them and if that's not clear and if you walk into a room and you know people might know who you are people might have heard of the business but if they don't know what you do then there's a marketing aspect to do in regards to that. Um, so from a sales and marketing perspective, you know, I, I, I'm i really, really passionate about um, continued professional development. Um, you know, I'm a massive reader. I'm, I'm a massive kind of learner. I just believe that, that I'm a, so the the one percent um, mentality is 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 very much alive in 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 my business and, and in me. And you know, the one percent mentality is your waking hours let's just say 60 average, our average waking hours, 1% of that is around 10 minutes. So we can all find 10 minutes a day for that continuous professional development, for that learning, for that improvement, you know, and that hunger to want to be better, to learn, to, you know, to, 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 to improve, whether it's in a new role or it's a, it's a, or if it's a new skill, you know, I think we've got to embody that. And from a sales perspective, we've just got to look at how we can scale our existing, um, our existing offering. And if you can't scale your existing service provision, then you need to look at options. Love it. And what's the best way to contact you? LinkedIn, email? What, what's, what's the easiest way? Yeah, LinkedIn's great. Um, you know, the office, LinkedIn, uh, mobile. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, you can find my contact details and my team. Um, so Chloe, Emma, Luke, any one of those guys. Um, but yeah, no, we'd we'd love to we'd love to chat to people about sales training and um, sales and marketing. Um, yeah, if you want a little bit of help or if you just want some guidance, I'm more than I'm always happy to just have a chat with people and say, right, have you thought about this or what about this? And you know, I think the northeast community is a really close knit community, and we help each other. You know, that's one of the reasons I love this region is that we genuinely want to help each other. So, you know, if you just want a chat, you, as long as you get the coffee, all's good. <laughs> Look, uh, thank you so much for this. It's been amazing. You know what? It's so well timed because I just think um companies are now starting to wake up to the to the realization how important sales and marketing is. It isn't an, an add-on thing. It should be it's such an integral yeah. part of the business because it, it, it's essential. But actually, more than that, in terms of that, the sustainability piece is absolutely huge now. And every business is, or if not, should be going through it in, in a big way. And so I think to to align that to sales and marketing, it just works seamlessly and perfectly. So I think you've you've set yourself up in a perfect position to work with the organisation. So well done. I know a lot of companies that have um, spoken really highly of you. So um, thank you so much for this. It's been it's been great. Really thank pleased. you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Manufacturing Leads podcast. It absolutely means the world to me. Please let me know if you need any assistance. As a business, we look at providing partnerships with manufacturing engineering companies to really help their recruitment and retention on the recruitment piece anywhere from blue collar semi-skilled staff 
right the way up to C-suite level executive appointments, but also much more than that. We run events, so please let me know if you're interested in any of those. If you are interested in indeed becoming a, um, a podcast guest, be very, very keen to speak to you as well. More than happy to do so. But as a business, as I say, we look at key partnerships to really help your recruitment, your retention, your marketing, your training. We really believe in the partnership piece and being extension of your business. We're very proud to work in this sector. I love manufacturing engineering and my staff are just as passionate about it as I am. So thank you once again for listening. Please get in touch to talk about anything we can do to help. Look forward to speaking to you very soon. Thank you.